Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, as we sang, we just thank you for who you are, your goodness. Lord, we ask that you now uh, inspire all of us, and especially as I uh, deliver this passage that uh, we're studying today, that we may truly be molded into the character that you want us to be molded into and come out of here praising you more and glorifying you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As you can see, the uh, theme is a common theme today. It's Matthew 18, verse 21 to 35. And uh, I don't know, when I looked at the passage, it's talking about forgiveness. And the first thing that came to my mind is, I beg your pardon. <laughs> that's, probably, that's why I used the title. It does probably make sense, but that's what I put in there. So anyway, uh, as uh, Pastor Jeff Broadnox already uh, discussed there in the Speaking of Life, it's amazing, you know, this passage, I think I gave a message again last year on the same passage. It's amazing how the Word of God, when we read it so many times, we can always get a different angle. So hopefully, you know, we've heard it already. Uh, Jeff brought an, ex brought an excellent uh, angle on, on this passage, and, and here I am again trying to do the same thing. But uh, let's hope that we can uh, find some more about this passage. So anyway, uh, this starts here in Matthew 18, verse 21, wherein Peter went to Jesus right, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? up to seven times, you know. And so another way of putting this is probably maybe Peter would have probably asked Jesus saying, you know, if my Christian brother repeatedly insults me, should I just continue on suffering this indignity? just because he said, I'm sorry? That could be an, another way of asking Jesus, right? Or maybe he said, could it, is it in the best interest of my Christian brother for me to go on tolerating this uncivil behavior when it is clear that his repentance is superficial and he has no intention of changing? That could be a way that Peter can ask Jesus, right? What would you do? How would, you know, if you notice, these are legitimate concerns. But in Jesus' answer, in this particular passage, he didn't really address those concerns. What do you do if it's obvious that somebody keeps repeating the same thing to you and it's obvious that he has no intention of changing? Do we keep forgiving him or you know, just say forgive, forgive? Thankfully, Jesus already addressed that issue in the previous verses, verse 15 to 20. But in here, in verse 22, he elevated this to a different level. He elevated this issue to a different level. You know, those are legitimate concerns, but that, that's already been addressed. Verse 15 to 20, if we don't have time to, you can look it up yourself. Those issues that I presented, Jesus already addressed that. But in verse 22, Jesus' answer to him this time is, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70, 70 times. 
So 70 times 7. It's really what Jesus said. You, you, you ought to forgive him 70 times 7. Peter was probably surprised. Whoa! Yeah. But what's interesting here is Jesus seems like he was alluding to Genesis 4, verse 23 to 24. Genesis 4, verse 23 to 24. This was talking about Lamech. Genesis 4, verse 23, it says, One day, Lamech said to his wives, Ada or Zillah, hear my voice. Listen to me, you wives of Lamech. I have killed a man who attacked me, a young man who wounded me. If someone who kills Cain is punished seven times, then the one who kills me will be punished seventy seven times. Wow. So Jesus used the same term seventy seven times. But notice, Jesus here presents forgiveness as the opposite of revenge. Here, Lamech is saying, oh, I'm going to revenge him 70. My revenge is going to be 70, seven times in intensity. But in verse 22, Jesus says, your forgiveness it should be worth 70 times 7. There's a big contrast between forgiveness and revenge. And then he goes on and gives this uh, parable. Verse 23 says, For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a certain king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. So this king wanted to do an audit and gathered his servants. And then there was this one servant in verse 24. And when he had began to settle them, there was brought to him one who owed him 10,000 talents. So those are different things. And then 10,000 talents, I think last time I... I gave a message on this. I gave you a value of 10,000 talents. But you know, with inflation, it keeps changing. See? Uh, to give you an idea, a talent is worth 6,000 denarii. Right? And a denarii or a denarius is worth a day's wages. One day of wage is equivalent to one denarius. So let's say a laborer today, the minimum wage in California now is about fifteen fifty an hour, right? So if an average worker, no overtime, works on eight hours a day, that's $124 a day. So for one talent, you have to work 6,000 days for one talent. And so it says here, it says here 10,000 talents. So you have 6,000 talents times 60 in order to get 10,000 talents. That's going to be 60 million days. He had to work 60 million days times 124 bucks. That's, when I calculated this, it's like 7 billion 440 million dollars and 50 cents or something. 7 billion 440 million dollars. And notice what the servant says, uh, verse 25. And 26, but since he did not have the means to repay, 
his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made, as repayment to be made. But the servant said, you know, he fell down. He said, Lord, have patience with me. I will repay you everything. Imagine seven billion four hundred and forty million dollars and he kneeled down and said Lord I can repay you everything it's impossible right seven billion four hundred and forty dollars and of course the king felt compassion on him he realized there's no way you can pay it with your, with your minimum wage. So what he did is the Lord of that slave felt compassion. And guess what? He said, okay, I'll give you a, an installment. I'll reduce that seven billion into just seven million. Can you do that? Can I negotiate with you? No, that's not what he did. He said, no, I'm going to lower it more to like 7,000. Maybe you can afford that. But no, that's not what he did. He said, guess what? Just forget everything. You don't even owe me anything now. Seven billion dollars. And of course, we can see the analogy here right? God's forgiveness. If we can put a dollar value of today, God forgave us seven billion dollars worth of debt. You're worth, you're worth seven billion dollars. And it keeps changing with inflation. So, yeah, sometimes it helps if we put some money value on the cross, which is even pales into comparison, what Jesus did on the cross. Just to have an idea, seven billion dollars. And that's not even enough. This is what God did for us. His forgiveness, his forgiveness. But then again, guess what? In verse 28, but that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and he began to choke him saying, hey, you owe me a hundred denarius is, uh, you know, I calculated that again based on a day's wage, $124 a day. That's a hundred days. So this is $12,400. This guy owes, owed him $12,400 and he's, he choked him saying, pay back. And so the other slave said, you know, hey, this verse 29, this, his fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him saying, have patience with me. I will repay you. But in verse 30, he said he was unwilling, however, but went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. You know, back then, if you owed something, yeah, you can throw somebody in prison if they can't pay back. So this is what he did. This is what he did. So his fellow slaves saw what happened and they were deeply grieved and he came and reported and they reported this to their Lord told him what happened. And of course, the king uh, you know, called back the, the servant and his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you, you prayed, you were repentant. You should have, and then verse 33, you should not also have, should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave, even as I had mercy on you? And verse 24, his Lord moved with anger and handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. 
And it ends here, it says, So shall my heavenly Father also do to you, if each of you does not forgive his brother from, from your heart. Now, what we can see here is this servant, I'm pretty sure he was grateful and repentant when his debt was forgiven. And it changed him somewhat. But what's apparent over here in this passage uh, and from this illustration is sometimes we can be repentant and be grateful about what Jesus Christ has done for us. But then maybe that for some of us, me included, that may not be enough to remove that vengeful attitude in us. Because remember, you know, he was repentant, he was thankful, but when, but then again, when a fellow servant owed him something, that vengeful attitude came out. Still, it's still there. And so, he did what he did. And so that pointed something out to me, like maybe that's an issue that we really need to revisit. Do we have an, a vengeful attitude? The attitude of getting even. Even though we're repentant and we're thankful to God, do we still have that getting even attitude? Vengeful attitude. And what Jesus Christ and what this passage is, is showing is that's a danger. That's a dangerous one to keep, to hold on to. We should not. Because, you know, anger or, or of having a vengeful attitude, that fosters what? Anger, resentment, grudging. And uh, I must admit, those attitudes are built in me. Even though we pray and, and uh, we're thankful to God, and, you know, every time I drive the highway, that vengeful attitude, <laughs> I think what David pointed out in Bible study, it comes out. And it's something that we really need to be reminded all the time about, to, to pray about, to ask God to really mold us into someone that doesn't have that vengeful attitude. You know, uh, I've read, you can look it up in, in, in the internet, even psychologists today uh, say that if you hold a grudge, or if you don't forgive because of grudges, it's not really helpful for your health even. Because what happens is, if we don't forgive, we, we, put, an, we put ourselves into that prison of vengeful attitude. And we imprison ourselves. And guess what? And guess who suffers? It's us. You know, if somebody did you wrong, of course we're hurt. But the other thing that follows is that vengeful attitude that will continue to linger and so we are imprisoned by that attitude. And if we don't get freed from it, eventually even our health will deteriorate. And who knows, the, the person who hurt you, he probably doesn't even know about it. 
He's probably going about his own life. While you're there, you know, hanging on to that vengeful attitude. Anger, resentment. And that trigger, triggers a, a downward spiral even in our health. Even in our health. So this is something that we need to watch out and pray about and, and meditate about. And I think the, the best way to uh, make it easier on us is to remember these two passages that I can think of. One would be Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35 and 36. Deuteronomy 32, verse 35 to 36. It says, what here? God says, Vengeance is mine, and retribution. In due time their foot will slip, for the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. For the Lord will vindicate his people, and I will have compassion on his servants when he sees that their strength is gone, and there is none remaining bond, remaining bond or free. We always have to remember, vengeance is the Lord's. Because it's built into us, you know, that justice has to be served, which is true. Justice has to be served. But vengeance is God's. You know, when, when we start having that resentment, holding grudges because of what happened to us, that's the time when we go to God and say, Lord, I have this feeling that's trying to imprison me. Help me to really understand and grasp that vengeance is yours. That one day you will do, that you will serve justice. Because only God knows how to serve justice the right way. Vengeance is mine. Again, in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 19 to 21. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 to 21. What does it say here? Romans 12, 19 to 21. Never take your own revenge. Never take your own revenge. Beloved, never take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. Wow, is this easy? <laughs> Somebody who's always insulting you, uh, hurting you, feed him. Oh, we, need, we need prayers. We need God's strength for that. And it continues on. If, if in doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Now, the most common interpre interpretation of this is, is that they, they say that Paul is teaching that the Christian is to do good to people so that they will feel ashamed when we treat them good and they will repent. You know, that's, that's the most common interpretation. But another interpretation would be, you know, in the Old Testament, every time burning coals is mentioned, it always represents punishment. In 2 Samuel, Samuel uh, chapter 22, verse 12 to 16, it refers to punishment. In Psalm 18, 
verse 7 to 14. Psalm 18, 7 to 14. And also in, verse, uh, in Psalm 140, verse 10. It means punishment. So another interpretation of this would be that Paul is just repeating what he said in, in Romans 12, 19. Never take your own revenge. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So Christians are, are to do good to wrongdoers, recognizing that a time is coming when God is going to execute judgment. Righteous judgment is coming for those who refuse to repent. So that should just kind of, because it, it's so common, it's so common to, to be sucked into that attitude. If someone insults us, uh, you know, uh, hurts us, we get into a vengeful attitude. But the best way is to remember these, to remember these uh, uh, passages, especially in, in, in Romans chapter 12. It says here in verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. These are passages which are so easy to read. But as, as I keep saying, we need to be centered in Christ in order to be able to accomplish this. Christ in us is the only one that can able, enable us to accomplish overcoming evil with good. Overcoming evil with good. So yes, God is so forgiving. We've already estimated a monetary value to it, roughly, which keeps changing. So yes, we should be grateful, but at the same time, recognize that we are always prone to having this vengeful attitude, but be of good cheer. The God of justice is going to take care of everything that's done wrong to you and me the right way. Amen? Amen. Amen.